Hi! Hello everyone, this is Aegon of Astora, and welcome back to my blind playthrough of Elden Ring. This is episode number 37. Oh my goodness, the most obnoxious <sighs> car just drove by outside my window here, my apologies. <laughs> this is episode number 37, being recorded on Saturday the 6th of May, 2023. I hope you're all having a fantastic day whenever it is you find yourself watching this. Just, for some reason, just feel so compelled to pick up all of these things. Even though, <laughs> don't remember the last item I actually crafted. I'm going to assume we can't interact with this friend now that they've given us their spell. Um... Something I noticed, but I'm not sure if this is supposed to be what's happening here, but it does look like this friend is levitating. Also, they've become sort of more crystal than human, or whatever they are, which is interesting. So... This, I assume, is that dreadful Erd tree we see on the map. It is indeed. Down there is the Seethwater River. I do wonder what kind of Erd tree avatar will be around this one if there is one at all. So, it is, uh, it's not actually early morning for once. Um, it's nap time coffee break. Lately, I've been doing almost all of my recording very early in the morning. Today, that is not the case. Because, yeah, early morning we had to go do some other stuff. And... Yeah, which is why I mentioned towards the end of the previous episode that I wanted to get that episode done and dusted so that we can move on uh, to the following episode, provided that I'm able to find any recording time this weekend, which... Oh, okay. So I was more or less expecting this, but I did want to just verify Golden Room Level 6. Because I did remember there being a one-way thing somewhere, one-way drop. Um, this is where we were going to go anyway, um, because we need to... Oh gosh darn it, leave me alone, wolf friends, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to infringe on your territorial rights. Have we climbed this tower? I think we have. Uh, anyways, yes, so it's later in the day than I'm usually recording, which is fine, but it means that I'm even more tired than I usually am, ironically. So you'll have to forgive me if my commentary is especially nonsensical today. Oh yeah, these are all the cannibal friends. I do remember this. And this Sight of Grace there, and there's the ladder. So we might as well just rest at the Sight of Grace so then I can take a sip of my coffee. And so that any friends who were aggroed just now have been de-aggroed. So what we're doing here is we are trying to sort of close this loop because we started at this site of grace here. We continued, uh, this was two episodes ago, I think. We came here, um, got murdered a couple times by the scythe women. I'm not sure what they're called. Um, and then decided to run up or, yeah, uh, climb up the ladder like cowards. Like the coward I am. Um, despite still being rather over-leveled. Uh, God, even just looking down, I'm like, do I even want to do this? <laughs> Should we just proceed? But yeah, obviously we want to make sure we're not missing anything. 
I was going to say, please tell me they're not going to start doing the same thing with ladders that they do with elevators. Just let an elevator be an elevator and a ladder be a ladder, please. <laughs> Don't want to have to, oh gosh, there's an item there. It's going to be crafting material or something dreadful, I'm sure. I know we have all this spy gear that we could use. Explosive Great Bolt, okay. That's, uh... Don't know that that was worth it, because we're obviously not going to be using any crossbows. Okay, yeah. Giants strung up here, upside down. So we have seen friends being crucified elsewhere in the world. Um, I want to say, oh, we're being invaded. I want to say this is the first time. Anastasia, Tarnished Eater, okay. I want to say this is the first time we've seen friends being strung up upside down which is reminiscent of Bloodborne the hunter's mark was an upside down oh gosh darn it was a friend being hung upside down sacred butchering knife um yeah and the upside down friend was a reference to the tarot card for gosh i don't even remember but shout out to redgrave for making me aware of all that stuff huge carving knife made to cleanly butcher the human body signature weapon of the ogress anastasia known to have eaten countless tarnished while disguised as a finger maiden that's dark it restores a very small amount of hp when it squarely strikes an enemy Okay, well, so, yeah. Is it the Death Tarot card? I, you know, I can't remember exactly the specifics of it, but um, there is a series I'm led to understand that some people find quite good that discusses it. It's called Dark Souls, or not Dark Souls, gosh darn it. Bloodborne, let's talk lore. Um, and some guy named... Aegon of Astora, who knows a lot more about this stuff than I do, uh, discusses that in great depth with his friend Redgrave, among other wonderful guests. For soft sadness. Yeah, quite sad. Uh, yeah, maybe I should go watch some of that guy's content to... <laughs> Uh, of course, Red, Redgrave himself also posted a video to his YouTube channel where he talked about this and its significance. So, I would recommend checking that out as well. Corpse Stench Shack and Golden Vow. An incantation of Erdtree Worship. Increases attack power and defense for the caster and nearby allies. Hold to continue praying and delay activation. This incantation has been taught to knights of the royal capital for generations, and knights sent on distant expeditions lean on it as a source of courage. Uh, the friend who's depicted in the illustration here looks a lot like some of the statues we see throughout the world. I can't place exactly where we see those statues but definitely looks like some of the statues we've seen in the game up to this point <laughs> just dreadful oh i'm scared friends um although you know this is actually the end of the road so <laughs> I don't have to be scared for too long. So, 
I guess in theory what you're supposed to do here is you're supposed to fight your way through all those friends, the scythe friends, and then you make your way here, and then you get to the bridge and you're like, oh gosh darn it. Although, Okay, I'm a bit confused now. Um, what I was going to say is that, yeah, you get here and then you realize, okay, you have to go and climb that ladder. Um, because you reach a dead end here, obviously. Stone sword key. All the bodies just piled up on the bridge here is not pleasant at all. Seek fat coin purse. Try jumping. Ah, oh, God. So lonely. Yeah, I don't think there's a fat coin purse down there. <laughs> so, okay. Um, yeah, but can you imagine if you fought your way through all those friends, you died a bunch of times, and then you get here and it's just a dead end? <laughs> At least, you know, there's a stone sword key there. So we have to figure out how to get up here. So, yeah, the Road of Iniquity would make sense, except that, you know, we only unlock that by, oh, is it here? Gosh. You think it hasn't been, like, that I haven't been actually recording episodes regularly because I feel like I'm lost. Um, Craftsman's Shack, Hermit Village, okay, let's... Warp to the first Malky. I think I know where this is, but maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. Yeah, this is on the top of the ladder, indeed. So, maybe there's another path up here that we missed. Oh, crud. <laughs> Thank you, iframes. Yeah, there's definitely... So we went that way, I think, but I think we're actually supposed to go here. Indeed. Another massive ladder. What are you? Is that a grafted friend? It is a grafted friend. Huh. <laughs> Simply dreadful. <laughs> so, are they going to jump down? Or do we have to go up and get them? Yeah, they're jumping down. Oh, oh. <laughs> you left and landed on a little tent there, friend. What happened? Oh, that was dreadful. Oh. Yeah, not a good start. Okay, give up on the parrying, Aegon. It's not happening. <laughs> okay. So that's interesting. Um, you know, my assumption about the whole grafting thing is that... Scavenger's Curved Sword. Is that it has something to do with... 
Um, I had a well-reasoned, or at least I thought it was well-reasoned, hypothesis about this that I was thinking about the other day, but it's... I can't really think of how to articulate it at this moment in time, so my apologies, but... Yeah, I think it, it probably relates to all the stuff we've been talking about in terms of... the racism and the, cl the classism of the world, in that... These people who are not nobles and they're not part of the golden order, trying to make themselves part of it. Gosh, I, I will downvote. Can you not? Oh, you have to press start. Any message that is in front of an actual like action prompt like that is just the most annoying thing possible. <laughs> Go back to like my Bloodborne blind playthrough and I just, that's the one time I get really aggravated when messages block prompts like that. Anyways, yeah, that grafting is a way, an unnatural way, obviously, of trying to, oh, Avianet friend, of trying to make oneself holy and yeah again i'm not articulating my point very well which is why i initially decided that i wouldn't actually articulate it and then i just started going ahead anyway despite clearly making very little sense <laughs> so you'll have to accept my sincerest apologies um maybe i'll revisit that later in this episode when i've had a chance to sleep a little bit more because yeah it's been many days in a row where i've not really slept very well just too much going on. Take a drink of coffee here. And hope that I don't walk off the edge in the meantime. What the heck is going on here? Okay, so that's not the Erd Tree Sigil. I assume that's Pray to Rykard Sigil. Thank you for praising my message, friends. Who are you? Oh. <laughs> Okay, so multiple different ladders here. I want to make sure that we actually check them all out. Yeah, it's funny, in each of the areas that we've, like the large overworld areas we've been to up to this point, we've taken about seven episodes to make our way through everything. I'd be curious to see whether Altus Plateau follows that same pattern. <laughs> the General Grievous from the prequel trilogy Star Wars. <laughs> well played, friends. Unfortunately, that was your one <laughs> that was the one card you had to play, and you played it immediately and simultaneously in a very obvious way. Okay, so we could climb up there. Where was this secondary path now? Oh, welcome, dear customer. Yes, right this way. Right this way. <laughs> okay. Um... All right, so they want to make sure you don't miss that, I guess. Hi, friend. Welcome. 
valued customer. Come, trade in our wandering emporium. Please, buy something. I'm hungry. I've been hungry so long. <laughs> Please. Sorry, friend. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to beg. It's fine. Uh, I will buy this stone sword key. Sure. As well as your cookbook, level 20. Sure. Arrows. Um. Yeah, we will buy some arrows as well. Just allow me to sell you a rune as well. We'll buy all your arrows. Sure. Guilty Hood, coarse hooded cloak of olive brown. The garb of those accused of lesser, le excuse me, the garb of those accused of lesser crimes indicated by the collar of sharpened branches. Confessor Hood, black hood for blending in with the darkness worn by church confessors. The church is outside the lands between dedicated to the teachings of the two fingers. Send confessors out to follow the guidance of grace. The confessors are loyal servants to the two fingers, ready to hunt down and quietly dispose of their enemies. Gosh darn it. The every item description, it seems, we read about the two fingers is about them basically quelling any form of dissent by just having everyone murdered. And, um, you know, like I said in an earlier episode, it, I can't say... It, it doesn't surprise me, but it's amazing to me that every item we get is basically like, yeah, the two fingers are awful. Alrighty. Well, you didn't have that much good stuff, I guess, but yeah, maybe we'll, oh no, these are bolts. I don't care about bolts. Okay. So, okay, well, we bought what we could. <laughs> Sad thing is that we actually sold more than we bought, but. Yeah, hopefully that he can eat the runes or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's not in the mood to play, I guess. Snake ahead. So yeah, the whole idea of runes I think are very interesting. So we could continue on that path. I want to see what this snake is, though. We could continue on that path, or we could go up here, and yeah, I'd like to see what the snake is, but I've been thinking more and more about the idea of runes, and um, thinking also about the Church of Manus Celis, and that was one of the items on my list, was to talk about the definition of Manus and of Celis, and gosh, um, it's been about a week and a half, maybe two weeks since I had that, I added that to my notes, but... And so I don't have the definitions in front of me, but if I recall correctly, um, I don't know if it was Manus or Celis. One of the two had something to do with hands. Okay, so that ladder just leads here. So they, they all lead to the same spot, seemingly. And this, I guess, will lead eventually to the Road of Iniquity. Question is, can we climb back up here after being down there? And it looks like we probably. Oh no, these friends are. are suffering from frenzy. I see a side of grace there. Lionel Knight grieves. Uh, we were very lucky to dodge that attack. Um, yeah, so the Cathedral of Manicellus, I think it has something to do with, first of all, it, it's basically, my understanding anyways, that it means something, oh gosh darn it, uh, rather than just speculating about what my memory is, maybe I'll just look it up. <laughs> it's time for Fun with Definitions. Manus in zoology is a noun which refers to the terminal segment of a forelimb corresponding to the hand and wrist in the hand and wrist in humans. I don't know why I said wrist <laughs> very strangely there. So basically again, hands, fingers, it's it's the same sort of thing over and over again uh, as we were just discussing. Now let's see what cellas means. 
Celis is a feminine name of Latin origin that means heavenly. It is a variant of the Latin name Celeste or in French Celeste, which is, while it is a more feminine name, okay, whatever. So Celeste, uh, or Celis, Celeste, Celeste. <laughs> so it's the root of celestial, in other words. So in other words, the fingers that we came across in the church of Manicellus. In the church of Manicellus, there was starlight shards everywhere, which suggests that it was all falling from the sky. And there was a giant hole in the middle of the cathedral or the church. And then in that hole, we find, we find a set of fingers. So in other words, the fingers fell from the sky. Same as the uh, Elden Ring, we learn, fell from the sky. We also have the you know, Astol, natural born of the void, who was born in the void. And then in the previous episode, we also acquired items which talked about uh, the prime primeval current. Glimpse into the prime, primeval current, he saw darkness. He was le left both bewitched and fearful of the abyss. So... I'm not sure if the primeval current and the void are the same thing, or the void and the abyss. Like, are all are all of those things the same thing? But regardless of that, all of these things are falling from the sky. Um, and it, insofar as the Elden Ring fell from the sky, we are all... The whole thing with runes is that we are essentially reading alien language, alien script... Oh, okay, so, and you know, I don't have any of this written down. This is all, I'm, I'm literally just brainstorming at the moment and thinking about what all of this could mean. And it's making me think about the movie Arrival, Denis Villeneuve's Arrival, which came out in 2016. Um, I had an episode in Dark Souls 3, Let's Talk Lore, in which I talked about Arrival. So I probably won't I probably won't. I'm not going to go into it here just because, like, I'm not prepared at all for it, and I would need to be prepared for it. But essentially, the whole idea in Arrival is that um, you have all these alien ships that show up all over the world, and the whole movie is essentially about a linguist who is trying to communicate with the aliens. And... Yeah, the, the alien language essentially changes the humans um, or uh, those who actually learn the language because the language is non-linear it, it doesn't function as a, a product of linear time. It's unbounded by time. Past, present, and future are all uh, one when speaking of this language. There is no past, present, or future tense. It's all just one tense. And when the protagonist of the movie, spoiler alert, learns how to read and understand and communicate in that language, they can travel through time. They see the past, the present, and the future all is just sort of one continuum for her. And yeah, I'm wondering whether what this whole game is about is basically the same thing. These aliens fall from the sky. The runes are their language. And in reading their language and trying to process their language and to use the language for their own benefit and to acquire power. So this movie is based off of the, um, based loosely off of the idea of linguistic relativity. So the principle of linguistic relativity holds that the structure of language affects its speaker's worldview or cognition, popularly known as the Saper-Whorf hypothesis or Whorfianism. Uh, the principle is often defined to include two versions. The strong version says that language determines thought and that linguistic categories limit and determine cognitive categories, whereas we the weak version says that linguistic categories and usage only influence thought and decisions. So I'm not going to read this entire thing, but I'll leave a link to the article in the video description below if you're interested in reading more about it. The physicist Ian Donnelly is the first one to bring up this theory explicitly in the text of the movie. Um, but the way he describes it is, and this is one of like, so there was a small handful of a small handful of lines in the movie that really irked me, but. Again, this isn't a movie review, so we're not going to go over that, but because I'm already, I've already spent far too much time talking about this. But, but the physicist Ian Donnelly 
he describes it like this, that if you immerse yourself in a culture, a, a foreign culture, and, and in the language of that culture, then you can rewire your brain. So if you've seen my video on Fallout 4, FF7, and Brainhood, then you know that I have a lot of problems with the notion or, or the assumption that we are our brains and that, that that's all we are um, because, you know, it's not been demonstrated yet. We have not solved the hard problem of consciousness and I, I doubt that we ever will. But but that's, again, an aside. But so that's how they express it in this movie. And because of how talented a linguist Louise is, she is able, Louise Banks, the main character, she is able to not necessarily rewire her brain, but to perceive time as these aliens who are called heptapods, uh, how the heptapods um, perceive time. And that is, they don't have linear time. They see the past, the present, and the future all at once. Their purpose on Earth is to teach humans their language so that humans can help them with some threat that remains unknown 3,000 years from uh, the time, the time, quote unquote, that the movie takes place. So again, the, the significance of this is that we're, we're seeing the whole movie from Louise Banks' perspective. And the movie actually starts with what appears to be her having just lost her teenage daughter to cancer or some rare disease. They don't specifically call it cancer. They just say it's a rare disease. And though in the beginning of the movie, it just seems like character backstory. That was actually the future. That was actually after the aliens. And it turns out that the father and, and this is going to sound really stupid, but I promise you it isn't. I promise you it isn't. The father is the physicist. Um, and it turns out that, yeah, they, they, in the process of doing this and, you know, spending months and months uh, basically holding what they thought was a classroom. And, and, and again, that's the amazing thing about the, the connection to this particular episode is that she thinks she's teaching the aliens, but the aliens are the ones teaching her. Like that, that is amazing to me. And, and to a certain degree, they both do in fact learn from each other, but you know, she thinks that she's teaching them English, but they already know what is going to happen. And it sounds, it is, the storyline is a little bit deterministic in a way, but it is, but it isn't. Um, but it, but there's no time travel paradox here because this isn't, these aren't different temporal dimensions. It's all one dimension, whereas the humans can see it, um, only see it in a linear manner. The aliens see all of time at once. So we get to a certain point in the movie where they've been doing this for months. Like there's a big jump in time at a certain point. And yeah, it's a long movie already, but the, the jump in time actually works quite well too. And you know, it's clear that they've been at it for a while and they have like a rapport with the aliens and stuff, but they're not quite there to, to try and figure out what's going on. And everyone around the world is getting antsy because there are, I think, 12 of these spaceships around the world. It's not just one in the US, like they're scattered all over the place. Almost every single one of these um, sort of government military encampments, they have, yeah, like translators and, and people trying different approaches to try and communicate with the aliens. And almost all of them interpreted the aliens' intentions, uh, the alien language. They interpreted the sign for language that they were there to give humanity the gift of their language the gift to see all of time unfolded before them um but almost all of the the human translators translated language or gift into weapon even the main character when they're flying to the spacecraft for the first time um the physicist ian he reads the introduction from her book where she describes language as a the first weapon that is drawn in a conflict so you can see that the various ways in which culture is embedded in language and um though you know this is a movie that uh, and again, I'm missing so much here. I'm missing so very much. Um, but basically, when she starts to understand the language, when she starts to really get how it works, um, 
she can basically access any moment in the future in her mind in order to bring about you know, a, a peaceful resolution to what becomes an alien crisis because people are scared and they think that the, the aliens are using phrases like offer weapon and um, the, the aliens that were interacting with, uh, I think it was the Russian government, the Russian military, they said there is no time, offer weapon and the Russian military government encampment, whatever, because again, we're only at this one camp, so we're only hearing things through other sources, um, through media broadcasts and whatnot. And what they were saying was, there is no time. They meant it literally. They didn't mean it wasn't like there is no time, like, you know, just a saying, that, like, there's no time, but there is time, but, you know, you got to be fast about something. That's not what they were saying. They were saying literally, there is no time. Like, if you just understand the language, you can see everything. And yeah, they all these humans interpreted it as basically a declaration of war. Um, but really, it was just they were offering language for every single human. And you know, I, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily to say that we are, you know, quote unquote, naturally predisposed to war and violence and things like that. Because I don't think that's true at all. And it drives me nuts when uh, people assume that to be true with, without it possibly being. Uh, provable. You can't prove those arguments, but but yeah. So so the movie basically ends with her. Again, we're getting further into spoilers now. So so there's a there's a point where some of the soldiers in the camp are riled up by sort of you know right wing crazy like radio broadca broadcasts and stuff. So really not like it's really believable the way they did it, and it's not over the top at all. Um, but these soldiers on the on the camp become sort of disgruntled at this whole thing and they're really scared and they decide that they're going to try and bomb the ship and it's a very large coordinated effort of just basically all of this all these soldiers who want to you know send the aliens a message because you know America needs to show force and that's that's not actually how it was phrased but yeah and so the aliens um, again, Avid and Costello of like the the who's on first fame, and even even in the translations of the movie, um, in I think it was in Brazil or something where they named uh, the aliens Batman and Robin, which makes no sense because it, it completely loses the context of the original language because um, they, they didn't think that people would know who Avid and Costello were. But I digress. So the the aliens basically they know the bomb is there and this is like basically a last minute meeting because they wanted to clarify what they meant when they said offer weapon. So what these aliens do is they basically do like a data dump whereas normally they just show one or two of these so sort of circular sentences like where the entire thing again is formed at once because the, their their language is free of the con constraints of time. And because they know the bomb is there, they, they basically shoot out like thousands and thousands of word circles at once, or phrase circles, however the heck we could even describe it. Um, and then one of them swims off and the other one sacrifices itself in order to ensure that Dr. Banks and Dr. Donnelly get out safely. But in, in this final meeting, uh, the alien basically, one of the aliens gets gets Dr. Banks to come up to the glass and to form a phrase uh, from her side of the glass using the like uh, using the black gunk on the other side and she does it and as she's forming this phrase she starts seeing the future so after the explosion she's passed out for a while she wakes up again and then she has a vision of a little pod coming down from the spaceship and picking her up and then, yeah, she gets to go inside the ship. And it's magnificently shot, like some of the best cinematography I've ever seen in this movie. Um, and this scene is certainly uh, no different. So this is the point of the movie where, yeah, like the, the, the realizations start coming where, you know, she asks the one alien uh, where the other alien is. So she asks Costello, who's the one who's left, uh, where Abbott is. And Costello responds by saying, and so we're seeing a, her translation of the language uh, with subtitles, via subtitles. And the alien responds by saying, Abbott is death process. So 
again, not a one-to-one -one direct translation, but it gets across the point, and that is that when you see the fullness of time all at once, uh, there is no died, there is no dying, it's just avid is death process. It's brilliant. It really is brilliant. Um, but then, yeah, she again gets an opportunity to play with the language herself uh, now that she's actually in the spaceship and um castella reveals to her he says louise sees future and then uh because she asks who is this girl and you're watching the movie the entire time thinking that 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 was something that happened prior to um the the events of the movie but nope it's something that happens afterwards so once she basically uses her new you know she she awakens basically at this point whereas previously she would see flashes of the future and uh like in this this screen grab here you can see um that yeah she would just sort of it seemed like she was having psychological problems but she was actually seeing the future um she was starting to understand their language and therefore her mind rewired itself but yeah so after all this happens she she basically prevents an international crisis um with um china basically declaring war on the aliens and she does this by, you know, using her new powers to go through time to, um, you know, find a way to do it. Or, in fact, not to find a way to do it, but to see how it was done, the aftermath, and then work backwards from that. Because, again, this is just one timeline. There's no paradoxes here because it's just one timeline uh, that she just sees it all at once. And then the two of them, like, they don't kiss or anything, but the two of them basically, you know, start talking and... Um, you know, we progress through time from there and, you know, some time passes and, and he says, do you want to make a baby? And we learned earlier in the movie that, that her daughter's father left because she revealed a terrible secret to him. And, and the secret is that she knew the daughter was going to die and she went ahead with their relationship anyway. And again, there's a whole ton of nuance that isn't coming across here, and I'm doing probably doing an awful, awful job of explaining this, but seriously, one of the best movies I've ever seen, and I can't get over how good it is, and I can't stop thinking about it, but all of this is to say that, yeah, basically the central conflict of this movie is uh, rooted in the embeddedness of culture and language, and in this instance in particular, it was, you know, the, this Western, um, and to some degree worldwide, embeddedness of violence and war as being normalized and something that's okay um in our language in our culture and that that is expressed through our language and in this case it almost led to disaster um because even this world-class linguist uh interpreted the alien's word or phrase for of that you know might more appropriately have been translated to something like gift or language she thought they were saying weapon and so did everyone else. So, yeah. The assault on Volcano Manor, the squalid, the sick, the blasphemous, a wretched, unending war with no glory. So, yeah, once again, I think that's likely what is happening in the world the whole idea of the runes you know ever since we we learned that the elden rune came out of the sky and then i was thinking about the name of the church of manicellus which basically a celestial hand the church of a celestial hand which is to suggest that the the hand fell out of the sky and that it sort of made that large hole that we find in which we find the hand um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not sure in and around that, how, you know, the order of events and how everything transpired, but I think I'm reasonably confident that that's the general outline of what has happened. Oh no. That's bad. One more. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so these friends all turn into uh, Cyclops from X Men, eh?
he was not aware I had the the kick equipped because otherwise there would be no reason to <laughs> turtle like that behind his shield. I have you low. So yeah, um, because I've been thinking about you know in Dark Souls and in Demon Souls the whole idea of the souls I think are relatively straightforward. It's something that everyone can sort of wrap their mind around. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, how clever it was, the whole idea in Bloodborne, that blood echoes were essentially, you know, the echoes of blood. So there were memories of the person with whom that blood was associated. And so, you know, I remember when Sophie Pil Pilbeam explained all of that to me and, and just sort of how mind blown I was by that. Um, then to learn, you know... Like, okay, there's this game called Elden Ring, and we all, sorry, friends, just leave me alone. Um, and in Elden Ring, you have these, it's all about runes. Like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So, you know, and so I've just been thinking, what are runes? And, and when we, you know, I guess I still don't fully understand the mechanics of it, because when we're murdering someone, how is it that we are, we're like absorbing the knowledge that they possess, which I suppose isn't Well the blood stains. I suppose it's not a not an idea that's totally out there. Great knife. Wow, okay, that's really interesting because that's the exact same weapon that that the crows had in Dark Souls 3. Volcano Cave. So yeah, in the world we have these scarabs that are rolling clumps of ash during their labors. And, you know, when we murder the scarabs, we are able to learn whatever the skills are that are embedded in those ashes, which they've accidentally rolled up from the battlefield. So I imagine it's probably a similar idea, but like, yeah. It's somewhat of a... Whoop. <laughs> Good old Havoc physics engine. It's somewhat of a similar... Or rather, it's the sort of logical extension of the idea that knowledge is power. That by acquiring the runes, you acquire the ability to gain power, whether through leveling up or purchasing items. The runes themselves represent knowledge that is otherworldly. It's from an, literally from another world because it fell from the sky. Um, that's sort of the best explanation I can come up with for the moment. You really scared me, friend. Jeez. But I'm not even fully convinced by the explanation myself. So, oh. Tch. Oh, that was dreadful. Sorry, friends. Yeah. <laughs> you all are not exactly cut out for battle, are you? Um, I don't know if we are going to want to drop down from that other spot before proceeding here. But yeah, these are all just sort of my half-asleep ramblings. Because, of course, you know, as usual, I've been thinking about the game and the story while doing other things that are maybe a bit more mundane and uh, don't really require a lot of thought. Cooking and cleaning and stuff like that. 
which, you know, I love to do. And um, you have a family of certain responsibilities you have to take care of first and foremost. But um, yeah, creates a lot of sort of idle time for idle thought, which uh, I have been filling lately with Elden Ring speculation. I say it lately pretty much since I've started playing the game. It's more or less what I've been doing. Gosh darn it. Oh my gosh. These tiny friends are almost as annoying as the birds. Not quite though. One-shotting everyone. Arteria leaf. Oh, we didn't check out the cookbook level 20 and coil shield. Okay, nor the great knife, which again was a weapon carried by the Corvians in Dark Souls 3. So this gives us volcano pot and roped volcano pot. A powdered volcanic rock is sealed inside. Throw at enemies to disperse a cloud of heat, dealing continuous damage to those caught inside for a short duration. Great knife. Large knife with a broad curved blade. The weapon is designed to slash and rend, inflicting blood loss upon the recipient. Coil shield. It looks like it's a serpent. Armament designed for gladiatorial combat rises above its peers as a particularly showy specimen. The sculpted bronze snake is a poisonous breed, boosting the wielder's resistance to poison. Unique skill, viper bite. Give the shield a quick shake to temporarily bring the bronze viper to life, inciting it to lash out and bite foes. Okay, we gotta see that in action. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. It's no buckler though, of course. Okay, so here we do have the Erd Tree Sigil. But outside it was a different sigil, so did they take to the Erd, Erd Tree Bannerman take to this cave to hide out from the other friends? Not sure exactly what's going on. Lump of flesh. Boss fog there. Oh, okay, never mind. I've already dealt with this. So just the boss remaining. Demi-human queen Margit. So we dealt with Maggie already and this is Margit. Oh no. Definitely still over. Ooh, jar cannon. Definitely still over leveled. Oh, and I didn't realize that we didn't read the item that, gosh darn it, that Alexander gave us as well. So let's start there. Jar that fits cleanly over the head when upturned, made with pride by Iron Fist Alexander. It is a uniquely jar like gesture of friendship. It boosts the power of throwing pot items. That's pretty cool. So I believe we saw this in like a player ghost or something previously. And I was very, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, it's the, uh, the I don't remember what it was called in Bloodborne. There was that cannon that was added with the DLC in Bloodborne, but jar cannon, which uses explosives to fire great bolts, deals great damage, but is slow to reload. Experimental firearm brought to the brought to the assault on Volcano Manor, where it was discovered that no one knew how to use it. 
Ah, that's interesting. Okay. Um, I want to say that that weapon was also experimental in Bloodborne. Part of the powder kegs? What was it called? Gosh, yeah. It's funny, I, I used to know that game like the back of my hand. And it's all gone now. <laughs> okay. Back to the entrance. Okay, where to now? I think that's probably it for here. So, I did notice a spirit spring nearby. Where was it though? It was not here, I don't think. Thankfully, <laughs> the demi-humans are actually quite slow. I think it was over here. Or was it? Might have been up there, but in any case, we have this bridge with a bonfire on the other side, so that's where we're going. And by bonfire, of course, I mean Sight of Grace. Friends. <laughs> this guy's like, okay, well, if he's not going, I'm going back too. <laughs> They're so calm about it too. For a second, I thought he was going to strafe off of the bridge. Ninth Mount Galmir campsite. So, the first and the ninth. Uh, so, presumably, this all correspond to, like... The... Oh, is that the spirit spring I was seeing? Presumably those all correspond to the um, the invading forces, like this is the first campsite we set up in Mount Gelmir. This is the ninth one we've set up. Sounds like a military naming convention, at least to me. So how are we supposed to get down to this Erd tree? I'm just gonna go back up here. Gosh darn it. Just wanna make sure this isn't where the spirit spring was. No. <laughs> Friends. Yeah. Um. Either I've missed it, or I might have been looking at this one here, thinking that that was it. Tch. Okay, so there's a ladder and a spirit spring, which is an interesting choice. Let's see what's over here.
Oh, there was a butterfly. <laughs> totally missed that. Okay, let's see what's up this spirit spring. Like they both have to lead to the same place. Okay. Full grown falling star beast. Okay, whoa. Don't fall off, friend. That would make for a very anticlimactic boss fight. Ouch. Oh my gosh. I'm like trapped here. Okay. Friend, can I buff my weapon, please? So was that other one... I feel like it was basically well, the same size. Is that a baby falling star beast? I'm dreadful at stamina management without my flask. It's like comical how bad I am at stamina management when I don't have my flask of wondrous physic active. Ugh. Nice little tail move you got there, friend. Whatever this, these like stone scales this thing has. Give them like a bajillion poise. Okay, that's bad. Cool attack though. Cool buff, I should say. Oh. Oh, I'm dead. Thank you for giving me a sec to heal. So yeah, they have the same horns. Oh. Not sure how else to describe them that Astel has. Horns or mandible? Yeah, those things. To click, click, click. Thank you for the demonstration, Falling Star Beast friend. Oh, and, it, and if you hit them, like in the fur. Oh, I'm dead. Oh, gosh darn it. If you hit them in that white fur, I feel like that actually does a lot more damage than if you hit them elsewhere. Oh, we're not going to make it through this, are we? Kamehameha! <laughs> wow. You're quite agile, friend. Oh, how to stamina. Oh, I'm dead. Okay, that could have been worse. I assume this is one of those boss fights you're supposed to summon Torrent for? Oh! Because otherwise you just... You're not quick enough. I'm dead. Oh, I got greedy. <laughs> okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, again, I feel like we are not making ample use of our talisman, but all the same, I also feel like We just need to be better at the boss fight. Yeah, let's try again. Cool way to start a boss fight. Oh gosh darn it, lost sight of him. Give me my runes. 
Even though we don't need them, but 37,000. to try and hit them in the the fur could only go by the sound there <laughs> even happen there. Oh. Okay, that works. Oh, gosh darn it. <laughs> Need to get better at doing that. trying to call a torrent. I was not trying to use my uh, telescope there. if we get iframes, they should also get iframes, so that's fair. Oh. It's not really of a store of depth perception moment there. No, again. <laughs> Dreadful. Yeah, you do so much more damage if you hit the fur instead of the armor, which I suppose makes sense, but... Get wrecked either way. Somber smithing stone level six. Five level six smithing stones. Wow, beautiful. And falling star beast jaw. Falling star beast jaw. Part of a falling star beast jaw. Hard and shining black fashioned into a weapon. With its sharp point, this colossal weapon can skewer foes. Unique skill, Gravity Bolt. Imbue the jaw of the Falling Star Beast with gravitational lightning, sending a bolt crashing down a short distance away. Can be fired in rapid succession. So how many... Uh, wow. So that can take us up to plus 18. And where is our bow currently? Plus 16. Okay, so that's quite good could also potentially upgrade our finger seal but I don't know what the point of that would be if we're not going to pump some more levels into faith so we should consider pumping some more levels into faith at some point that would improve the buff on our weapon it's 
so we have some starlight shards here again so the starlight shards i think being right next to this massive crater i suppose it's a bit on the nose but the idea being of course the falling star beast as we sort of figured out earlier in the playthrough in one of the dungeons we fought a falling star beast and i thought okay that's seems like a pretty obvious thing that these things are falling from the sky um and to sort of <laughs> yeah really hammer this point home you have some starlight shards here and something i don't either didn't notice or didn't point out earlier you have these sort of patterns on the bowl here thank you for the rating friends didn't get any sound effect for that that time just kind of weird um and there's a little spike thing here so Again, perhaps meant to be some sort of something else I've talked about in past playthroughs, in particular in Dark Souls, or, or sorry, rather in um, Bloodborne Let's Talk Lore, in the episode in which we went to the Upper Cathedral Ward, I think the episode was called Make Contact, talked a lot about, yeah, the idea of sort of cryptography as far as it comes to the idea of like you know how would we communicate with aliens and there are different ideas about like how we would and wouldn't do that and you know one of them is essentially a bunch of scientists um came together physicists essentially and of course they would suggest that mathematics is the language that we would use to communicate with advanced extraterrestrial beings and so so this is how we get over to the road of iniquity, essentially by hopping from there to there. And yeah, uh, in this instance, I think it's something very similar happening, where again, you, you have these runes are essentially a language that these alien beings are speaking, or not speaking, but using to communicate. So, you know, I think in a later episode, I just wanted to see what the difference was in taking this ladder. And I guess the only difference was it's a lot cooler. <laughs> it's a much cooler uh, and more cinematic start to the boss fight when you take the spirit spring up. But um, before we proceed, let's actually go upgrade our bow and whatnot. And uh, yeah, we don't have enough runes to level up. So let's just go upgrade our bow. So yeah, as I mentioned in a later episode, I'm going to want to provide a more detailed and prepared explanation of the whole idea of the language thing from Arrival, as well as the, you know, real life, how do we communicate with aliens problem that wound up um, being sent into space on the Pioneer spacecraft and the Voyager spacecraft, which are the as far as I'm aware, the only human artifacts to ever make it out of the solar system, depending on how you define the solar system. And so it was thought, okay, we should have some sort of, you know, uh, hieroglyphics on that, you know, uh, intelligent alien beings might be able to understand on these spacecraft in case they come across it, because then they'll be able to learn something about us. If we were to ever come into contact with extraterrestrial beings, that you know, the thought is that we would wave to them. And so you see this reflected in some, in, in, in pop culture mostly, um, but also in, in, you know, really scientific things like the Voyager and uh, like the plaques that were affixed to the Voyager 1 and 2 and the Pioneer, I believe, 10 and 11 spacecraft or, or uh, space probes, um, all of which are very points in leaving the solar system depending on how you describe uh, how you define the solar system and these plaques include um yeah a series of of basically uh, uh hieroglyphs that attempt to you know in case these spacecraft are ever recovered by an extraterrestrial civil is it uh, extraterrestrial out in space because they are going to be and they are the first things in existence to have left that humans have made to have left the solar system and so if by some remote chance they come into contact with extraterrestrial beings, 
uh, the idea was that we would attach, uh, and Carl Sagan uh, was central in a lot of this, that we would attach these plaques to these spacecraft so that if an alien came across them, that they, if they were smart enough, if they understood mathematics, and, and that's a whole series of other things come out of that, like the assumption that we could that we know this universal language that an alien would be able to understand, but I'm not going to get into that now. But basically the idea is that, you know, they look at this this uh, this plaque and they should be able to learn things about us uh, on the basis of uh, the key, which is, which shows the hyperfine transition of hydrogen uh, and establishes that this is the key. So uh, from the one state to the other state, that is one bit. And you see the little one at the bottom there. And then using that that legend, that key, that they should theoretically, if they, they uh, have an understanding of our conception of mathematics, that they should be able to read the rest of what's on this plaque, uh, including a map of where the solar system is relative to a series of, I believe, 21 different pulsars, and that is spinning stars out in space. Um, and also, you know, a series of other things about us, including... Uh, this image of a man in the foreground and a woman kind of really slouched over in uh, next to him but somewhat in the background uh, that the man is holding up his hand he's waving and uh, this is all very interesting to me I hope it is for you too because I've been talking about it for a while now but um, one of the really interesting things about this is that they were originally conceived of as holding hands, and of course the whole thing is very binary in a way that, you know, is, uh, it's it's problematic in some ways, but again, we're not going to get into the issues with it just because there are plenty, and I, I, I would be here for a long time, but I do think that this is a really cool and a really admirable thing to do, um, but they were originally drawn as holding hands, but, uh, the idea was that the aliens would be might get confused, might confuse it for a single organism because they're holding hands. And so all of this is just to give you an idea of how vastly different an extraterrestrial being would likely be to us because they evolved in completely, you know, literally an otherworldly planet that may be completely and utterly different than us. And they may have evolved under evolutionary conditions that we don't even, we don't have a chance of understanding at this moment but you know there's still this idea there that we can communicate with them with the laws of mathematics and to bring it all back finally around to the make contact gesture the idea is that rather than waving because they could theoretically conceive of the wave as being an act of aggression uh, if we did something like this which would it makes the I guess the outline of a right angled triangle that yeah we would communicate to them that hey we understand mathematics so whether or not uh, our idea of mathematics is in fact a universal uh, mathematics that an alien being would understand is another question entirely but that's the idea behind this and the Voyager and Pioneer spacecrafts I think are really good and really interesting real world analogs to that Well, where have you been hiding? I took you for dead. No matter, it's all the same. Lay out your arms, then. Oh, we're one short of what we would need to get it up to plus 18. That's a shame. So, we need to go, I think it's the ninth Mount Gelmir campsite. Indeed. So yeah, Volcano Manor. Can even see a site of grace in the lower right. 
don't think that's the road of iniquity side of grace. I think the road of iniquity side of grace is somewhere here, but I suppose we'll see. This place looks a lot bigger than, oh gosh darn it, I always get so scared when we're so close to the edge. It looks a lot bigger than we've seen on the inside, but maybe, I feel like every building, or like dungeon or castle, legacy dungeon I guess you would say, has that same, and maybe that's my problem and not the game's problem, but I feel like every dungeon looks bigger on the outside than it is on the inside. And again, maybe my it's not on the game and that's on me. I have problems with perception or something, but... So yeah, marionettes all over the place here. I still don't fully know what the deal is with them, who's animating them and why. Unless, of course, they are also serving the Erd Tree, in which case they would be part of the whole hive mind. So, yeah, this all looks like stuff that we have yet to do. Every tower has these, has this, like, scaffolding on the side. Unless we're not actually meant to go to all these places. Okay. So yeah, I guess it just sort of, um, our plan for the area just sort of unfolded naturally, which is to say, you know, we're doing the west end of the plateau first, the Mount Gelmir side. And then after we're done here, we will head east to the capital. I feel like we're doing a much better job exploring the area than, than we have up to this point in exploring other areas. Doing a great job, Avionet friend. Sorry. <laughs> They're so shocked, they just sort of stand there. They're like, oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> okay. This is one of those running in circles, friends. I was thinking about that note we got. About unseen assassins. I suggested maybe that might have to do with this or the shades of the imps. I don't know. I doubt it, though, at this point. Oh, we've already... <laughs> Of course, we already picked that up. Hey, someone, someone looted this tree here. Who was that? And of course, it was us. So this presumably is not the assassin that was talking about. That torch would presumably have helped us with that one boss fight. Okay, I have been marking those friends on the map. I think. Yeah, there's one here. There's also one in Kalid in Fort Gale. Okay, good. So we do have them on the map. And then there was one on a beach somewhere here. Right here. Perfect. I hesitate to even say this because I'm afraid that... Uh, Oh, jinx it and speak it into existence, even though, as I mentioned before, I don't really believe in jinxes. I don't really, I don't believe in jinxes, but all the same. Wouldn't want to tempt the universe. Oh, gosh darn you, hands. Okay, so these are the hands that we ran into. I forgot that they were here, because we did see them last time we were here. After we left Volcano Manor. Um, the power in the neighborhood went off twice today because uh, someone on a nearby road uh, flipped their car and like knocked out an electrical pole. And so the power went out at around noon 
And then again at like two or three or four or something sometime in the afternoon. Today's kind of been a blur for me. Um, what the heck? Okay. That was very strange. <laughs> Couldn't make contact with the hand for some reason. And yeah, so now I'm paranoid that I'm going to lose this recording session. So I've only been this particular recording has only been going on for 15 minutes. So I am going to want to make sure that it doesn't go on for too long, just in case something does happen again. Those were tiny hands. This is a, obviously a much larger hand here. Let me give you a hand, friend. Hand. Oh, no. That friend definitely had their finger on the pulse of the situation. That's terrible. I'm sorry. This hand is spazzing. Ooh. <laughs> it's like uh yeah i don't even know what this is but no oh, gosh darn it i wouldn't let me lock onto them i suppose, <laughs> I suppose that makes sense so yeah i assume those friends are a farming target if you I'm trying to upgrade a special weapon. Because the drop rate actually does seem to be quite generous. I see a hand over the edge here. Thanks in part to the messages. fingers on the brink okay what the there was a very low frame rate shadow there <laughs> oh fingers so that's that castle we've already dealt with so yeah I, I hope that those of you who were annoyed at my earlier just a skull rolling down a hill at my earlier exploration heuristic and sort of the uh, unintended consequences of that in terms of the viewing experience. I hope that that has been at least partially addressed the way we've been approaching things since that, since I've started to have feedback rolling in and yeah, I don't know. I think it's been better. So, uh, but I also didn't really think there was a huge problem previously, so maybe I'm not the best judge of it. So you will all have to let me know. But, you know, we've been doing the dun dungeons as we've been coming across them. And, yeah, I think, you know, to the credit of all those people who complained, it, it has definitely been, I think the episodes flow better as a result of the change. So um, one thing that we don't do enough as people in general, is admit when we're wrong. And yes, I was wrong with the way I was approaching the game. What the? Oh, wow, the friends are even fighting from up. I would not have thought that they would have activated from all the way up here. That's impressive. <laughs> so again, I've talked about lazy farming. That would be an extraordinarily lazy farming route to just sort of and of course, we've already picked up the map here, so we might as well refresh our memory if, as far as what it says. Map of Mount Gelmir and environs. Mount Gelmir, which houses the volcano manor at its summit, is characterized by sheer cliffs and ominous skies. These qualities only became more pronounced after the shattering. So it was bad before, it's only gotten worse since. This ghost furnace in rough shape, it looks like. Ooh, Lord Rikard. If this putrid field of death is what your blasphemy would bring, 
that I can no longer abide. No one can. <laughs> okay, I <laughs> may have dialed it up a bit too much for that one. Um, the problem, insofar as it can be described as a problem. What is with these rocks? They look almost like wings. Um, the problem, insofar as it can be described as a problem, and we've, of course, already uh, unlocked that site of grace. So they are supposed to be wings? Yeah, so the problem, insofar as it can be described as a problem, is that the text scrolls, or the, the uh, dialogue remains on the screen, each line of dialogue, for the same amount of time for the ghost uh, dialogue, no matter how much dialogue is actually there. Okay, so it's one of the worm face friends. So, yeah, um, you have the same amount of time to read just a couple of lines of text as you do to read many lines of text or sorry many words i should say not lines of text because it's always just one line but or typically just one line anyway okay yeah we've still not i don't know if that's what that message was getting after but we've still not actually reached that Erd tree, minor Erd tree. Gosh darn it, I just realized because of the power outage. Oh, that's potentially terrible. I just realized that because of the power outage, the game audio because, you know, I have speakers um, hooked up to my computer as well as headphones. Because of the way I have my setup arranged, the audio comes through both the speakers and the headphones. So typically, I actually have my speakers off. But when the power went out and when it comes back on, the speakers sort of automatically turn on. So, yeah, my sincerest apologies because it's possible that for the last 10 or 15 minutes... There has been audio leaking through from the speakers into my microphone. So, yeah. I hope that's not the case and that I'm apologizing for no reason. But you'll have to forgive me if that is indeed the case. Larval tears. Why would they be dropping larval tears? Unless they are like a creation of... Why is it always death? creation of a larval tear or a larval tear is used to create them oh okay the earth tree is right here simply just dreadful yeah that's not happening friend <laughs> Is this where we find the painting? No, it's from the other side. All right. I need to stop being a coward and just <laughs> forge on ahead. Fan daggers. Okay, we have a boss fight coming up. I'm almost certain of it. Hence the uh, the fact that we can summon someone. One of our ghost friends. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's a... Gosh darn tree spirit. Are you joking? 
Ugh, I guess that's, yeah, I should have expected that. I hate fighting these things, so I'm summoning me. <laughs> Let's go, Regret. Let's do it. Okay, Regret. <laughs> I got your back. But yeah, it makes sense because, you know, I wasn't sure what sort of tree avatar we would find. Makes sense that we would find an ulcerated tree spirit here, given the, sh the state of the tree. It's obviously in dreadful shape. Wow, what's better than one regret? Two. Get wrecked. <laughs> Good job, regret. <laughs> Leaden hard tier. Cerulean hidden tier. Can be mixed in the flask of wondrous physic. The resulting concoction temporarily boosts one's points. Sorry, yeah, I don't see the point in reading these anymore, other than the last line. Um, this one eliminates all FP consumption. However, this effect is only brief and will quickly ex expire. Okay, so that's so you use that like right before using a buff or something. That yeah, that's really interesting. That could have many very interesting applications. I'm sure. It would have had to have worked pretty hard to balance that, I think, so that it wasn't, like, mega overpowered. Alright, so we finally made it to the other side of this bridge. Now, was it worth it? Oh, gosh darn it. No depth perception. Golden arrow. Carved arrows made in tandem with the Urtree tree bow deals holy damage, highly effective against those who live in death, and able to prevent them from rising again. Yeah, the, the whole mechanic of those who live in death, I think, is so silly that you can just hit them a second. Like, just, it's so, and maybe I'm just saying that because, obviously, I didn't realize that you could do that until it was pointed out for me. But, you know... If you played any of the Dark Souls games, there's really no reason to have thought, hey, I can do this, you know. Um, yeah, anyways, at least in Dark Souls 1. Though the mechanics from Dark Souls 1, if you... <laughs> Steak is floating in the air. Um, if you were to assume that, yeah, the same thing was happening there, then... Okay, I don't believe it. Gosh darn it. Okay, well played. But yeah, anyways. I assume that's me just sort of trying to save face <laughs> without fully realizing it. Where is this site of grace? It's just right in front of us. Okay, let's rest. Um, we might just use the rest of our runes to level up again. You know how I know I've grown? I see that skull there, and it's okay. We can just leave it. <laughs> 104 we need. Alright, 731 <laughs> we're doing now with our right armament one, which is quite, quite tasty. Okay, so where to from here? Oh, 
Oh, get out of here, you silly hand. <laughs> More hands are there. Tiny hand ambush. Still more tiny hands. So. It's over in this direction, I want to say. Oh, of course, the giant hand is still chasing us. Hasn't decided what it wants to do yet. No, oh, okay, we might as well fight them. It was a very indecisive hand. <laughs> Didn't think indecision was a trait that hands would have, but I suppose. The more fingers, the more indecisive they become. I'll file that one upstairs for later. <laughs> what was this friend here? Um, I'm reasonably certain when we were here last, we just sort of ran past them. Because we were running for the... That hand is also upset. We were running for the map. What the heck? like to get these friends away from the giant friend. Is that just another worm face friend? Oh no, it's a giant with a like cloak over its head. I wonder what the deal is there. Hi, giant friend, are you here to find out why all these other giants are hanging upside down? Oh. I would be very upset as well, giant friend. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Frenzied giant friend. I'm sorry, frenzied giant friend. Seems like you and your people have been through quite a lot. I would be upset as well. Oh gosh darn it. I'm sorry giant friend, yeah that's not pleasant at all. So something over to the side here seemingly. Overcast, oh overcast, and then no evening. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, that was weird. Whoop, whoop, ooh, whoop, ooh. <laughs> Again, <laughs> when you see the seams of the world, it's, yeah, it's an experience. That is some good coffee. <clears throat> Is that all there is over here? Sacramental blood, okay.
we've been there, so no point in trying to jump, because we would die anyway, but... Either way. Okay, so I think... Where we need to be going is the prison town church. Because I think at this rate we've already done everything. This looks like a developer message over here. Oh, I thought this mountain of fire, but I hardly, <laughs> but I hardly feel a thing. I'll have to head further down. So, that's why we find him here. Makes sense, because he's facing in that direction too. So just in case you don't immediately go in that direction like I did. Very interesting. Okay, I'm not to not totally cured yet. Okay, so this is the front door now. So rather than warping to the church, let's just take the secret passage there. Oh wait, was Patches there? Oh. Hello again. Welcome to Patches Emporium. Okay, it doesn't look like Patches has anything new. Cheers for that. Alright, let's see what's going on. So, Zarias did say that she heard some slithering in this room. Okay, first off, try it left. Yeah, it, it was so long ago that we first went through all of this that I, that I barely remember <laughs> what was involved, so... I just wanted to double check everything. No, they're everywhere. I'm sorry, slug friends, but... If I were to walk by, you would just attack me, so... <laughs> so yeah, there was that item there. Right, and then there was an item here as well. So, this is that door that does not open from the other side. Yeah, I do not even remember what was there. Um, it was an item presumably having something to do with serpents and uh, trying to attune you to what's going on here. So we received that intel pretty early on. Okay, we got pretty lucky there. <laughs> the character takes a drink, we take a drink. Um, I don't know how we managed that last time, because we were a much lower level at that point. And here we are indeed. 
at the prison town church. Might as well rest to make it our active site of grace. Okay, here we are. So this is the actual area. Yeah, and a uh, ton of lizard people. So my exploration heuristic would suggest that we go up before down. So let's head up before we go down there. insofar as we can go up, which does not really look like we can. So this is a legacy dungeon, can't call torrent in here. Yeah, serpents everywhere. These serpents have wings, it looks like. friend cannot do anything from up there oh, or can they oh my goodness okay they're cradling a baby that's frightening I don't know if it's just this one I'm gonna assume that they've always had that going on I've just only now noticed it take a while <laughs> oh there she goes Okay, we'll deal with her when we come around, I guess. Okay, down before up it is then. Whoa! Okay, I was not expecting that. My goodness. What a dreadful place. Okay, there's someone we need. Regret, we need you. Thanks for summoning me, Regret. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you. I'm not going to make any eye contact with you, though. Okay, I suppose that's fair. <laughs> okay. Oh, doggos. Oh, gosh darn it. Regret. Help. Help. Why is it always for all calling finger remedy? Scarab's all the way over there. That's one of those uh, Capra Demon friends. <laughs> Nothing like activating friends early before they're supposed to be activated and sort of breaking the interaction. Oh my gosh, so much AP. It's pizza cutters. Oh no, I'm dead. 
Ooh. Where's regret? Where's regret? What is he doing? <laughs> oh my goodness. He's currently being no assistance whatsoever. There he is, jeez. I don't know how the heck we're supposed to fight those things. Jeez Louise. Okay, uh, we might want to equip some stanching boluses. Put a stop to that blood loss, you know? No, regret's dead. certainly lost him for the time being I think because I don't oh yeah I guess it depends on whether he can jump or not fire arrow oh stop it your poison pot these zombie friends wow good for you zombie friends Regret, keep moving. <laughs> Regret, come on, keep moving. <laughs> Doing a little moonwalk there. Okay, we, maybe we just need to move them along this way. Oh gosh, darn. Did it. <laughs> well done, Regret. Thanks, Regret. <laughs> okay, we have some zombie friends here as well. Are these different zombie friends? Oh, they are different zombie friends. So... They're like zombie versions of... Those friends we first met in Stormville Castle. I think they're supposed to be nobles or something. Maybe not nobles, but that's interesting. Crimson Amber Medallion plus one. Very nice. So yeah, it doesn't tell us that much more. So we go from 1704 to 1823 with to go from the normal nothing to the plus one medallion. Good stuff. The normal nothing. Oh my gosh, this place is dreadful. Massive pool of blood here. So we still have to explore 
all of those rooftops there. This is a very interesting location, I think. Oh no, Mimic to your friend is... Okay. We will return here. Yeah, you know, I gotta say, oh, I'm impressed by the AI pathing. Although, having said that, let's see if they can make this jump at all. Or do they just warp? <laughs> I think we made a mistake. <laughs> I'm going to assume you just warped. Yeah, they look just like those other friends. Except zombie-esque. Thank you, Regret. Weathered straight sword. Straight sword with a rather short but wide blade. Simple to wield, it was known as the sword of the people. Though the Erd tree styling is still visible, time has not been kind to this sword, now merely a shadow of its former self. This is that friend we hit from above, I think. I don't even know who regrets fighting. <laughs> Okay, there's a lot going on here. You know, we found an albinoric blood clot up above. In fact, these may be albinorics. Judging by the f their their legs have withered into nothingness. Great omen killer cleaver, and uh, we the last time we saw an omen killer was in the Albanarx, or at least the first time I should say, was in the Albanarx village. The blade of this huge loathsome loathsome cleaver comprises a row of amputated. Omen horns, weapon of slaughter wielded by omen killers. That's really dark. The hideous horns cause blood loss, adding vibrant colors to the ongoing mayhem. And the skill is wild strike, which is all about swinging a weapon with abandon. Level six golden rune. Prison town, indeed. So, in other words, it's a town full of prison cells. I'm going to assume Regret has already killed that friend. Urgery Seal. A formless sacred seal decorated with, the Ur with an Urgery Crest, once the focus of religion in the lands between. Even though the Elden Ring is shattered and the Urgery has dulled from its former radiance, earnest faith continues to hold the answers. 
I need 40 faith to use this. Oh, you can't even see it. I was hoping you'd be able to see it. Okay. Very interesting stuff. So I wonder, was the whole town imprisoned? Like, what does prison town mean? Is it a sort of ghetto where everyone in the town is a prisoner? Or, based on what we've seen, I imagine the town was... The town included not just... Oh gosh darn it, regret. I need to get a running start here, thank you. No, oh, okay. This is gonna be... Bad news. I don't think we're gonna make this jump. Oh, I don't like this one bit. Yeah, from what we've seen, I think... The lizards are probably the jailers. Or the women with the pizza cutters and whatnot. It could go either way, I suppose. Okay, where do we jump? <laughs> Just after that message, okay. I'm so scared, friends. Oh, we did it. <laughs> Stone sword key, okay. Definitely not going to try backstepping. Getting flashbacks to Los Isolith. Dark Souls 1, oh, pot friends, no, okay. They seem to be inert pots or non, oh, uh-oh. Okay, never mind. There are some active pots here. Smoldering shield. <laughs> no, friend. <laughs> it's just mosey on by here. Bring this friend over here and then we'll leave them in the dust. Thankfully, the big jar friend appears to be sleeping. <laughs> Alright, that works. As we all know, platforming is not my strong suit. <laughs> um, so this whole place is sinking into the lava. A la Iron Keep in Dark Souls 2. Bubble friend, are you here to show me the way? That's not a bubble friend, that's one of the zombie friends. Wow, you got some graceful jumps there. Well done. <laughs> Who? What? Where? Why? No idea where that one even came from. <laughs> okay, here we go. My stomach just like sank for a second there. Didn't, didn't expect I did it. <laughs> Indeed, friend. Oh.
The messaging system in this game is wonderful. So yeah, they even have these cages here that presumably people were kept in. Terrible. Dreadful. Absolutely dreadful place. You see all the remains of the, I guess, yeah, presumably jailers. Ugh. Could this be a you don't have the right? In short, you don't have the right. Oh, you don't have the right. Okay, we're back here. Um, I think we're gonna equip the regen item, this one. Because we're a bit short on flasks at this point. Which tends to be my problem in legacy dungeons. Although it looks like we've done everything. Save for exploring those rooftops up there. So we have a scythe friend. Or is it a broken scythe friend? It's a broken one over to the left, or to the right rather. should say. <laughs> should probably have made a mental note of how long this episode has been up to this point because I think this might just end up being a long one. I'm scared, friends. I'm really scared. Oh, no. Sorry, Albin Ark friends. Whoever did that to you, they... There's a special place in death for them. Oh. Gosh darn it. I don't think we can avoid fighting them. There's too many of them. Oh no. Okay, they're trying to eat us. Oh, Elven Arcs. I'm sorry. I am genuinely sorry. No, I don't think I needed to kill that one. Gosh darn it. <sighs> These candles made of blood or something, and they're just meant to look like blood. 
terrible. Absolutely terrible. If it was you, Serpent Friend, who was responsible for this. <laughs> I suspect he's just a, you know, regular friend. All the same. Shortcut exit. Oh, there's slugs down there, because of course there is. Why wouldn't there be? Are you supposed to kick it down? No. It's already kicked. Explosive great bolt. There was a shield we picked up at one point we have not yet read. Smoldering shield, a small shield made upon Mount Gilmir, forged from uncooling lava. Resists frost with its heat and can even be used to deal fire damage if wielded as a weapon. That's cool. Oh. Ah, beautiful. Guest hall. What a place for guests. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, let's um, go back up top so that we can explore those rooftops. Simply dreadful place. Regret. No subtlety to the mimic to your regret, it just runs in. As you might expect. Oh no. <laughs> yep. To my point. <laughs> just uh, reckless abandon. You know, can't really blame him. But yeah, it's pretty funny all the same. It is a good thing he can warp. Otherwise we'd be in trouble. Oh no, this is bad, potentially. Okay. 
I was reasonably certain we were going to fall off there. Golden Rune level 9. It's always a risk when you're locking on to friends in a precarious platform situation. Because if they move in an unexpected manner, then, you know, you're tethering your movement to them by locking on such that you can very easily just sort of walk off the edge. It's a big problem in Sense Fortress in Dark Souls 1. That's where I first learned of the perils of locking on in those situations. Hmm. Okay, we should have dropped down to get that item from up there, but it seems to be too late for that, so... Oh, unless we can just go around from here. And it appears as though we can. I suppose we might need to do the intermediate step first, which is here. Just in case. I feel like we would have been fine for fall damage, but you really never know. Oops. <laughs> Ah, smithing stone level 5. Oh gosh darn it, but now we're just down here. Okay, warping back up. Whoop. <laughs> So, yeah, part of the reason I suggested they're the jailers is if you think about what they're doing there. Extending their neck up and then looking around. They are sort of engaging in what you might describe as panoptic surveillance. Although, in that case, it's not quite panoptic surveillance because you can verify it. Um, and panoptic surveillance is that which functions automatically because you can't verify it. So an example of this would be the idea of Santa Claus. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. So we teach kids very early on. This is not something I will be teaching Aurelia of Astora, but in, in, <laughs> in any case, um, we teach them that Santa can be watching at any time. So just in case he is watching, you should be good. When, yeah, really we should be teaching them to be good, you know, ironically, as it said, to be good for goodness sake, not to be good because Santa is watching and you might not get good gifts for Christmas, which is a ludicrous way of trying to get kids to accept consumerism. But anyways, small copper dome shaped sh round shield carried by the man serpents of Mount Kelmir. Said to have been tempered in lava, it boasts great resistance to fire. So, in other words, um, you don't want, sorry, in other words, the, the way it was sort of extending its neck up and looking around. So it's not necessarily an example of panoptic surveillance or, or disciplinary power, but... You know, it is an example of, like, you know, they are trying to keep an eye on things and using their long necks. It's, uh, you know, one of the benefits of being a serpent, I suppose. Okay, we've already got that, so... I think that's actually terrible. Oh, okay, never mind. You can do it from here. Okay, I suppose that's it for the rooftops. I thought there was more to this. But I suppose not. It's all just leading down here. Alrighty then. No, oh, gosh darn it, regret. But wait, did we go to the right here? I don't know if we did. Oh, 
that's a rude, right? Ah, ladder. Yeah, I don't think we came over here. Smithing cell level four. These noises I'm hearing. <laughs> oh, is it just it's just like an alternate entrance to this place? Gosh, I'm scared. You can see an item shiny there. We're supposed to get over there, though. Okay. scared. Okay, we can go down there. Oh no. so scared. <laughs> but yeah, I should explain before I pick this up. The whole idea behind discipline or, uh, disciplinary power and panoptic surveillance is that if you have a cylindrical prison block with an observation tower right in the center, if the observation tower has uh, two-way glass or one-way glass where the people on the inside can see you, but you can't see them, then the surveillance even if you don't have someone watching at all times the people will behave as though someone is watching them at all times because someone could be watching them at all times so the power is uh constant in its effects but it's unverifiable so with the snake friend extending the serpent friend extending its head up and looking around um if you're a prisoner you would see when they were doing that so it would be verifiable which would not qualify as panoptic surveillance in other words so yeah albinark staff and mask short staff with a blue glintstone embedded wielded by the albinarks of old the albinarks harbor a secret they cast sorcery using their innate arcaneness So that one said Albinarchs of old, and I assume this is going to be Albinarchs of new. Mass made from the largely unaltered hide of a young Albinaric. Raises arcane, but reduces HP recovery effects of the Flask of Crimson Tears. A far cry from Godskin, this Albinaric hide mask is the product of malicious mockery. Dreadful. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a good message. I think this just spits us back out where we were previously. So this is going to take us to one of the towers. Oh, 
Hold on to level 10. Oh, and then you'd go back down. So that was a terrible message. The one that said, first off, left. If I'm... If I am where I think I am. Although I may be somewhere else entirely, actually, now that I think about it. Um, let's make sure there's nothing else down here first. Because, yeah, there was a message that said, first off, left. But left leads into the actual place. Whereas right would have led here, and then we would drop down, and then, yeah, so. Uh, not only are they killing omens, and then using their pustules as spikes for their weapon, but they're also doing all sorts of horrifying things to the Albanarics. Basically, uh, my interpretation of those item descriptions is that, yeah, they're creating them using arcane methods. Dreadful. Why is it always sound? It's a good question. Oh yeah, so, yeah, in other words, that's a terrible message. The one that said first off left, because really it should be first off right. Because you go left eventually anyway. Alright, well, yeah, before we proceed, I think we're going to call it an episode there, because I think that we've been recording for quite a while for this episode. So, thank you all very, very much for joining me, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.